to Talk to Internal Audit, our dedicated Facebook Live series. Today's session is about auditing supply chain management. And I'm joined by Maxine Granger, who with her team won the award for Outstanding Team Private Sector at the Audit and Risk Awards. And I'm delighted to be talking to her again today. Maxine recently appointed as Group Audit and Risk Director for DFS Furniture Group. She was previously Group Head of Audit and Risk and Head of Compliance and Assurance. She's worked in many sectors, including the financial services sector, retail, and the regulatory environment. And one of her passions is setting up audit and risk functions from a blank canvas and watching teams grow and develop. Maxine, as you may recall, was a guest on the show in June 2020, almost a year ago to the day, in the early stages of the pandemic. And when she spoke, where she spoke at length about the initial supply shock faced by companies and the need for smarter, stronger and more diverse supply chains. And today she returns for part two of that conversation. So grab a tea and join me as we delve into auditing supply chain. But just to remind you, if it's your first time or just in case you've forgotten, I'm Liz Sandwith and I'm the Chief Professional Practice Advisor for the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, UK and Ireland. The Chartered Institute is the only professional body dedicated exclusively to training, supporting and representing internal auditors in the UK and Ireland. We have approximately 10,000 members across all sectors of the economy in all parts of the UK and Ireland. And our members are part of a global network of 200,000 members across 170 countries, all working to the same international standards and code of ethics. May I also remind you that you can acquire CPE points for these Talk to Internal Audit sessions. So don't forget to log them using our CPE template. Details of how to claim from this live stream can be found in the comments section. So today we're looking at auditing supply chain management and we're going to try and keep it a very practical hands-on session. Supply chain management audits of suppliers, factories, global operations are an essential component to safeguarding your brand. Compliance with social responsibility, sustainability, trade security, anti-bribery, health and safety, conflict minerals and product quality assurance are challenges that all organizations face. The risks are endless and they continue to expand as a consequence of globalization and also part of the impact of the pandemic. So remember, if you like Facebook streams and want to spread the word, and I'm sure you do, be sure to share today's live stream. You can do so by clicking the share button in the corner of your screen. After all, the more the merrier. So can I just remind you, if you're just joining us, Welcome to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. Today's session is about auditing supply chain management, a practical hands-on session with myself and Maxine Granger, Group Audit and Risk Director, a former guest on the show and a recent winner at the Audit and Risk Awards, where she and her team won Outstanding Team in the Private Sector category. So, can I just reflect a moment on supply chains before we um, hear Maxine and I ask her some questions. Supply chains have come under immense pressure. Past considerations focused on efficiency and suppliers ethical integrity. However, the emphasis has shifted to the robustness of the supply chain and concentration risk. Major companies have also had to assess the ongoing viability of key suppliers and where appropriate, offer financial assistance by paying upfront to ensure their own operations do not go offline. 
Vendor insolvencies have the potential to cause massive disruption. One blind spot that few companies accounted for is the level of outsourcing to overseas territories, such as India and parts of Southeast Asia, and what that might mean in the event of a crisis. The business should be aware of weaknesses, pressure points, and potential bottlenecks in its supply chains, tracing all the way back to raw materials. Flexibility and agility can help to mitigate these. Indeed, while overseeing a more complex supply chain requires more effort, having alternative suppliers on standby in various geographies reduces concentration risk uh, should shock events occur. Internal audit can assess whether the business has paid sufficient attention to the need to remodel supply chains and outsourcing strategies to improve its operational resilience. This remodeling may take the form of embedding contingency measures, such as I mentioned previously, alternative suppliers, or permanently repatriating production and business functions to better cope with future problems. The business should understand and be able to explain the rationale behind the supply chain model and the approach that it uses, including any lean inventory management practices. Internal audit can seek evidence of the quality of data and the governance of the decision-making that underpins the going forward supply chain strategy. So without further ado, let's roll up our sleeves and have a really practical conversation with my guest today. So welcome, Maxine, our guest speaker. Hi, Liz. Hi, Maxine. Thank you for having me. And we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So perhaps initially you could provide some context in terms of the size of your internal audit team and the breadth of your remit within your organization. Absolutely. Um, and again, really um, happy that I've been called back to do the session two. Can't believe how fast time has gone. I think it was nearly a year ago now that we covered this subject. Um, firstly, again, thank you for acknowledging the award. We're all still very happy as a team, as is the business overall. And just like to say congratulations to all other category winners. So to answer your question, Liz, um, in a summary, our group audit and risk function has 14 heads, including myself. We do have a couple of vacancies at the moment that we will hope to complete in this new financial year of ours. Uh, we merged as a group function in July 2019, so two years old this year. And we've been fully established ourselves across the group as a group audit and risk function. Um, we've built a strong and effective risk management and audit methodologies to suit our group brands. Um, and we have four brands under the group umbrella. So we've got Sophology, DFS, Dwell, and Sofa Delivery Company. And the acronym we're using for that now is Sodelco. Our scope of activity co covers all areas um, from customer services, our retail stores, right through to our finance activity and our distribution centers. So we audit everything and we do it with a risk-based approach. Thank you ever so much, um, Maxine. That will be really helpful, I think, in helping um, our listeners to understand the context of your responses to my questions as we move forward. So let's get down into the detail. How is the company's, so your Sodelco's company supply chain and outsourcing risk determined? Absolutely. Um, so now more than ever, a lot of focus has been given and put on our risks around supply chain, whether that be internally or outsourced, as you mentioned, Liz. So we created a new department that looks at this area and manages the risks associated. So we did a backward thinking and we looked at our successes and opportunities and challenges from pre and post pandemic. And this is why this new team that got created in December of last year has been put into place to really kind of drill down into our customer expectations on our suppliers um, delivery and expectations and how we work together to mitigate any risks and to be aware of any new entrants or any emerging risks that we could face. 
So our supply, suppliers are across the UK, Italy and China. As you can imagine, we have multiple suppliers because we have four brands in the Umbrella Group. So we've naturally been assessing the risks associated with all pre and post pandemic. Thank you. That was really helpful. Interesting that you're thinking about it in terms of customer as well as supplier, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I, I guess, really great. And I know one of the things that um, came out of your first session with us was some of the people who'd listened to it said, ah, now I know why my sofa hasn't been delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, we have lead times there for a reason. And, and sometimes, just like any organisation, you know, things happen. Um, naturally, we've been, you know, massively affected by the pandemic, as mentioned in the first session a year ago. But I think the, the key thing to remember for anybody in, in this world, in any sector, any organisation, is to really do your business resilience activity, really look at what the, the, the pandemic brought. And as well as the pandemic, Brexit's brought a lot of challenges as well, because as I mentioned earlier, Liz, not all of our suppliers are in the UK. Um, so we have faced challenges, um, but I'll obviously ex explain that because I'm sure your questions will bring that, that information out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maxine. So my second question, has a recent supply chain risk assessment accounted for supplier concentration risks and dependencies? Yeah, again, so this is what we do naturally on a, on a monthly and quarterly basis is work with our group, group leadership team, which, as you would expect, are mainly the key sponsors and control owners for our principal risks. Um, so one of our top principal risks at the moment is our ability um, to meet all of our customer orders through our sourcing capabilities. Now, that's kind of very brief, but behind that sits massive kind of work that's going on our scoring, looking at our macro risks, looking at our inherent residual and our target, as you would expect from a full risk assessment. So controls of this risk are frequently assessed and managed to ensure that we are capturing and monitoring our macro risks, as mentioned, and our controls. We are in frequent communication with all of our suppliers to ensure we can plan for any known risks or respond to any new entrants. So for me, um, directing the area of risk, it's very, very important that we work as uh, risk business partners for everybody throughout the business with our risk and control owners so that we're being proactive rather than reactive what we have been in some cases when the pandemic hit. So we're trying to learn from what happened in the previous financial year. Our financial year runs from June to July, you see. So we kind of look back and then look forward. And our relationship, working relationships with our stake, uh, with our suppliers, sorry, have been better than ever because we both know that, you know, we've got to work as a team to get our goods delivered to our customers and make sure that we are providing the right information to our customers at all times and that our lead times are met and that they're realistic. Thank you. That, that was a, a really good, comprehensive answer. So thank you for that. So I mentioned earlier um, in the intro bit about some, some organizations repatriating uh, product production and raw materials into the UK, or certainly a little closer to home, perhaps into Europe. Do you think that the cost savings of sourcing materials and parts from overseas outweighs the operational risk that it presents? So good question. I think my initial response would be, I would say you would need to ask my group CFO that one. However, um, however, the risk is constantly being looked at, especially now with the changes that Brexit, Brexit has brought with it, as mentioned. However, for us, Brexit was one of our top 10 principal risks, but has recently been archived. So it's been removed as the top 10 first risk it was so number one um, and we've archived that risk now as all risk were mitigated through effective controls we created a brexit risk committee as well um, and that was really led very well hence why it's now been archived we do believe that yes the benefits of overseas suppliers does weigh out the risks associated it's about being proactive and ensuring that we are not at a loss and at the same time being able to supply goods to our customers in a reasonable time with a reasonable time lead time we're also working and have done a lot of work um, with our suppliers around the important subject that i'm sure many of you have been talking about in your organizations which is the environmental social governance esg 
So working closely with all of our suppliers, no matter where they're based, allows us to know our risks before they become an issue. And I think that's the key bit. Really good point. And I think ESG is on everybody's agenda at the moment, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So please, can I just say welcome if you're just joining us and remind you what today's theme is. Uh, we are talking about auditing supply chain management. Very much a practical hands-on session uh, with myself and Maxine Granger, Group Audit and Risk Director, a former guest on the show and a recent winner at the Audit and Risk Awards, where she and her team won Outstanding Team Private Sector. And I'm going to keep reminding her of that and you while we go through today, because I know she is incredibly pleased about it and very excited. Um, so I don't think she's come off the ceiling yet, which is great because the awards are really important. So moving on, Maxine, can I ask you another question then? Have alternative suppliers of key materials and components been identified and put on standby in the event of a further crisis? And I'm thinking, you know, the climate change agenda, the requirement to be net zero, the three scopes that are involved in all of that. Is that factoring into your thinking now as well? Absolutely, and thank you for the reminder about the award. You are absolutely spot on there. We are still, still on the ceiling. I'm sure we will be for many months or years to come. <laughs> um, and if anybody wants to apply for the next year awards, I'd definitely recommend it. So to answer your question, Liz, yes, we had a small issue with our foam supply last year. And when I say small, you can imagine it did put us into panic mode, um, but we went from a risk to crisis mode and the business dealt with it really, really well. However, we have worked with the suppliers to ensure that they have extra, extra stock to prevent this from happening again. So again, we understood what the issue was, we've resolved it and we've put mechanisms in place to prevent it from happening again, again, by working, communicating with our suppliers. We also have our own manufacturing based in the UK so we have backup if needed. As mentioned, we are at the top of our game now with all things ESG and climate change. And we've recently appointed a group head of environmental and ESG, along with an, al an analyst that looks at all of our required regulatory reporting and disclosures for our requirements of ESG on an annually basis. We also have one of our top principal risks being business and operational resilience to an uncontrollable or unforeseen event which includes risks around suppliers and links to input post-COVID learnings. Group risk recently linked in with a non-operational and operational business areas, and we captured any learnings of our successes and opportunities that have come out of the pandemic. If you haven't already done this, guys, it's a really good piece of business resilience work to do. And from experience, it's really gone down well with our group board as they really like seeing this oversight. So just to conclude my answer there, Liz, from a climate change perspective, we are trying to do a materiality, materiality risk assessment on all ESG subjects. Now, when, why we're going through this at the process, hopefully when we get the output of that from a external source, so we've got an independent lens looking at all of this, that then inputs to all of our suppliers so we can work collaboratively together to get the best outcome. Uh, great answer. Thank you. And thank you for the tip about uh, the resilience and how much boards and I presume audit committees love to see that, because I guess it helps them think future uh, and also think about what we need to do to prevent similar things occurring in the future. So lessons learned as part of this, but incorporated into your future planning. So Moving on again a bit, so does your business have short-term contingency plans for outsized, outsourced, not outsized, outsourced business functions going offline? Yes, absolutely. Again, you know, I, I do sound like I'm repeating myself, but it all links together. I think, you know, you would be very naive um, to not look at what the pandemic has caused and naturally do your own normal BAU risk assessment. So for us, yes, this is part of our business continuity plans and our disaster recovery plans. And these are tested annually. Um, both were also reviewed in detail post pandemic. Um, and the reason for that is the changes, the new ways of working, what this has brought, not just internally from our suppliers and the communication and the overseas activity, but also for our colleagues' well-being. 
um, and working from home. You know, we know, for example, it's been talked about multiple times now. I think we've exhausted the subject, but we as an organisation, as a group, are moving quite quickly into a new hybrid way of working. So to ensure that we've done our risk assessments, assessed everything about planning ahead and looking at what we've got, is it fit for purpose? Absolutely. And to stress test that, what we do from an audit perspective, our audits are all risk-based approached, as mentioned. We make sure there's a cycle there. So for example, we work with our risk team, capture the risks associated, and we stress test those. And then we link back in with the risk team once the output is given. And if them controls are not sufficient or are not actually what is written in our risk registers, then we reevaluate and we work with the risk and control owners to make sure that they are adequate. Sorry, it wouldn't come off mute. So, so Maxine, does that mean that you as internal audit get involved in doing the stress testing or do you work with colleagues across the business who do this, the stress testing, for example, finance perhaps? Yeah, so a bit of both really. So naturally as, as an organise, as a group function, we will come off audit plan and we will provide consult, um, consultancy and advisory work. So it could be a lot of kind of gap analysis, stress testing with that activity or on plan for our new financial year audit plan that we've just started this week. Um, obviously within that, there's a lot of assurance activity whereby we will take learnings from the pandemic to look at all the information that's been implement, implemented now through add-ons for business continuity plans, add-ons for disaster recovery, what happens if we would need to work offline, you know, how can we react, is it sustainable? And we would stress test against that. We would look at the risk registers, so look at the risks that maybe the IT department and the finance department have on their operational risks. And again, we would take that, put it into our scope, look at the relevant risks for that business area, and then we would sample test against those. And again, link back in to close the loop with the risk department to say, are they stronger or are they weaker to what you have in the risk register? That sounds a very comprehensive, very thorough exercise. And I'm sure provides huge uh, assurance to your audit committee in terms of risk and control. Thank you for that. So does your organisation have enough insight, do you think, into the governance and controls within contracted suppliers and their ability to manage their own liquidity and their own supplier risk? You know, it's the who supplies the supplier. And do you have right of audit in your contracts? Yeah, thank you, Liz. And again, really good question. I think it's something we all need to be thinking about at the moment. Just before I try to answer in summary, one of the things that I've done um, of building the new financial year plan, because let's be honest, everyone, you know, it was one where we couldn't look really look back and compare scores, especially for us, because it was completely different. So what we tried to do, we put an extra category within our audit plan this year, which is called group initiatives. So anything that we've made changes to last year, so we've implemented a new uh, product or initiative or there's been changes, we are going to audit against all of them initiatives to make sure they've been done correctly. And that includes our suppliers. This leads me on to the answer to your question, Liz. So yes, all of our suppliers, um, contracts existing and new, have a clause in them to add that all suppliers are auditable by our group internal audit and or the biz who the business deems to be the correct person or uh, company to do so. And one of our principal risks is um, availability of banking facilities to support the business and other sources of capital, capital. This includes our suppliers. And the other detail behind that is we have multiple suppliers, not just for goods or for parts. As you can imagine, like any organisation, there's multiple contracts and each one of them has that clause in there that it is auditable. However, when I was talking with the group leadership team to find out what keeps them up at night, you know, to really think about what I'm going to add into the plan with still being independent. The common theme coming from them in sessions with gathering information from the group leadership team was all a lot around supplier contracts in respect of outsourcing. So you may have a supplier contract with a company that we trust and we, we've worked with for a little while, but we're now starting to see that they're working with other clients so that we're outsourcing and they're outsourcing. So it's third party, if you like. So we've really had to deem down and to look at, OK, so if we're using a supplier, who are they associating themselves with? And it's our brand. So we're looking at it from a risk of reputational damage. So from a, a contract perspective, to answer your question, yes, 
we have it in there to make sure it's auditable. And I would make sure that you work with your legal department or whoever signs the contracts off and for existing contracts too. A lot of people put it in as a new thing. I think you need to make sure your existing contracts are also sufficient and have that auditable clause in there for group audit or external audit to view. Um, so yeah, so one of the key things we're looking at in the new financial year plan is making sure we're auditing the contracts contracts as clients to make sure that there's no reputational damage linked back to us. Okay, that sounds sensible, doesn't it? Because you know, you you're trusting your supplier to produce goods and services or raw materials that you need, but it's your reputation, your brand that's on the product at the end of the day. And I guess it's you the customer would complain to if they had issues. Absolutely. And we've seen that before. So it's in our best interest and any organization's interest to find out who are you working with, but who are they working with? Because like you said, absolutely spot on there, Liz, the link and it, the link and the direction of travel comes back to us as a brand. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. So do your contracts have a balanced contractual relationship between your organization and service provider? And do they include regular renegotiations and exit provisions to allow you as the company, the, the customer of the supplier, to update your supplier base? Absolutely. So as mentioned, by having the close working relationship with our suppliers, this means that flexibility and negotiations are not a surprise and or an issue. Um, we use multiple suppliers across our brands to ensure best products and reduce risks. Um, as we have more options if one supplier goes bust, for example, and or cannot provide a particular product or part. We have our own internal parts team as well. And again, the great thing about being a group business is that we have, we all sell the same thing, but in different, a different way, different unique products, you know, but we can help each other and share best practice and share parts and products if we need to do so. A good answer. Can I then ask you um, opportunity for you to, you know, come up with anything you want to share? Do you have any tips that you might like to share with our listeners in relation to undertaking an audit of supply chain, perhaps for the very first time? Yeah. And you know what? To be fair, it is, it is quite daunting. And I'd say you know, if you'd asked me that two years ago, um, before we merged as a group function, it still would have been daunting. But now with the massive, you know, crazy year that we've had for any organisation in some way, shape or form, you know, at the moment, it's a bit, you know, a lot of information. You think, how do I tackle this? Where do I start? So I think my personal opinion, having experienced some of the things that we've gone through, I would say, do your research first before any opening meeting or creation of a terms of reference for the audit subject. Um, get some examples of supplier contracts to understand what the T's and C's actually look like. Have an engagement meetings um, with your head of supplier cha supply chain. Meet with your senior leaders and ask, you know, if any concerns that they're aware of, any particular supplier or setup issues that they have, what's keeping them up at night around that subject. Finally, understand, as I mentioned, your ESG strategy, if you have one, and how this will affect the audit scope. Because things like modern slavery with your suppliers that are outsourced, people tend to forget that there's multiple layers that need to be looked at and covered within an audit of supplier, whether it's UK or international based. People think that modern slavery only really affects overseas. It doesn't. Modern slavery is happening here now in the UK. So think about how you could normally do the scope and then expand with all the new things that this year has brought and future things that are coming on the horizon i.e. ESG issues and, and things that we must apply to. Um, work with your risk team to capture known risks um, recorded. Like I said, like we work together, it really, really helps assurance to the board and to the stakeholders. Um, so you can stress test the controls and therefore provide assurance, as mentioned, to, um, to your stakeholders and the auditees, you know, work with them to, to ask them what are their concerns? What have they learned from the past year? What would they do differently? what keeps them up at night and just really engage and involve your auditees. Um, that, that's, that's work for us. And we've got a supplier audit due in the new financial year, as mentioned, Liz. Okay, thank you for that. Do you also look at things like customer complaints, for example, if you're doing a, a supplier audit, might that be a source of information for you as an internal audit? Absolutely, that's a really good point. I think um, 
naturally we do year on year we do regulatory audits so we'll look at regulatory and financial complaints because the business is heavily regulated by the financial um, conduct authority but in respect of product and supplier absolutely because if the products is not is not right and we're getting themes coming out you know um common themes and trends coming out of them complaints then from an audit perspective we need to ensure that we can look at that and understand the root cause so i think that's a really good shout liz to kind of do a bit of a sample test on your complaints i'm sure in an organization of any size these will be categorized um, and easy to find when doing the testing thank you ever so much for that and and can I just sort of move away from your organization and just think bigger picture? You know, when you are as internal audit looking at the horizon, thinking about what's coming down the track, um, you talked about one of your uh, suppliers being in China, um, but it doesn't really matter which country. Do, do you also look at the challenges in those countries, the changes in territorial legislation and risk? And, and factor those into your thinking as well? Or is that sort of outside the scope of internal audit? Yeah, again, a good question, Liz. So we, we started working over a year ago now with a company called um, Track Record Global, I believe it's called. So they're an outsourced company who focus on all of them things and more that you've mentioned. So they are there to do biannual and annual audits um, overseas and UK to make sure that they are looking at all relevant regulations, which include modern slavery, et cetera. And the great thing is they cover the whole ESG spectrum. So they will go out and they will travel there and they will do an independent audit. Again, part of the contract is that we will not sign up to you and continue or continue with your contracts if you don't allow us or permit us to come in and audit you. Because again, it goes back to that reputation of financial uh, damage. So yeah, absolutely. And then we will work with the TRG, Track Record Global, to understand any key themes, to understand what we can do internally or, you know, anything, for example, we need to be kind of focusing our lens on or shifting the plan to be flexible to support. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing I've heard uh, recently, not, not from your sector, not from the, the retail sector, but I think it was uh, construction sector, uh, and they were talking about moving some of their manufacturing closer to their um, supply chain. Um, so, you know, whatever the product was, if your supplier was Eastern Europe, for example, uh, then maybe they would move manufacturing there because that would be more cost efficient, perhaps. Is that something that has been considered by your organisation, Maxine? Not that I'm aware of, Liz. I can understand why some, you know, different sectors are doing that, though, from a cost and risk perspective. I have, I mean, don't quote me, but I have heard on the grapevine that eventually, in the next coming years you know it will be an expectation to not be able to source leather from outside of the uk so any leather sourcing or whatever it may be you know from a sustainability and doing things responsibly for your products and your materials it would need to be sourced where you sell them from so it'd be the uk for us so that's something that i've heard about coming down the line but again very linked to esg um, but to answer your question, it's not something I'm aware of. I think this takes me back to your question before, Liz, about what is the cost you know, from an operational perspective? You know, is this weighing out the risk and the cost? And I think at the moment to can have that as a principal risk, to be able to monitor it and continue to assess the controls and are they fit for purpose? Unless the macro risk really became high and a red flag, I don't think there's any need for us as an organisation to be moving to that. OK, thank you very much. Just so you're aware, uh, and I know you know, I am the wife of a dairy farmer. So just take your eyes off our cows because she can't have the leather from them. <laughs> well, now that I know that, Liz. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much for that. Um, so we're coming towards the end of, of our session today. So if you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. Today we talked about auditing supply chain management and we had a really great practical hands-on session with our guest speaker Maxine Granger, Group Audit and Risk Director, a former guest on the show and a recent winner at the Audit and Risk Awards where her and her team won Outstanding Team Private Sector. So may I say a huge thank you Maxine for coming back a second time. We don't have many people who uh, volunteer to come back a second time. Huge, huge thank you for that. 
and for sharing your thoughts with us. I think there's lots for us all to reflect on and for perhaps you to share with your internal audit colleagues, because, you know, Maxine just mentioned that supply chain was an audit on her annual plan for this year, this next financial year. And I think it's probably going to start appearing on everybody's um, internal audit uh, program of work. So it may be worthwhile you thinking about supply chain, reflecting on what Maxine has mentioned to you, and also, you know, just looking into the horizon, into the future in terms of, you know, what supply chains means to your organization um, and why it's important and how, as Maxine has talked about, it can impact on the brand reputation of your organization, as well as cause delays to you being able to deliver your goods and services to your customers. So lots for us all to think about and reflect on. And I feel almost certain that there's going to be a part three with Maxine when she'll come and tell us more about her ESG agenda. So really looking forward to that. The live stream is available afterwards for those of your friends or colleagues who may have missed the live version on the Institute's Facebook channel. And I know talking to um, colleagues that sometimes um, teams listen as part of a team meeting to these sessions and then have a conversation afterwards, which is a really great way of making sure that, you know, you're all on the same page, whatever the topic is. You can follow all of the exciting things the Institute is doing on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube. And as a member, of course, you have access to the latest edition of our Audit and Risk magazine, which is on your website now and will include also a substantial article on disruption. So worth having a, a read. In case you've not already checked it out, we now have a brand new community hub for all of you to get involved in. It's a new gateway to all our community focused activities and endeavors. It includes details of our virtual forums, our regional network and opportunities to volunteer and support your, your institute at both a uh, national and regional level. You'll find a list of all our special interest groups. So if there are any that pique your interest, reach out. Our community hub is open to all members and non-members and it draws on our learnings from the COVID-19 period. So watch this space as it continues to take shape over the coming months. It's very much an alive page and therefore really worthwhile checking out, um, making sure you're not missing anything that's coming along. Just also so you're aware, we launched our new disruption hub on the 8th of July. So please check it out. It's on our website and the link is included in the comments box um, of this um, Talk to Internal Audit session. There are case studies there, there are some video interviews, there is an article from the Audit and Risk magazine, there are some great infographics as a result of a survey that we did, and also some infographics as a result of a series of round tables we did with um, chief audit execs trying to understand the challenges that they have faced in the last 18 months and how they have dealt with them. There are also some signposts to some relevant articles from key businesses and the firms. The, the key principle of this site is that it's alive and that you can go and check it out if you face a, a disruption within your organization. So it isn't purely pandemic related. As we move forward through the next 12, 18, 24 months, there will be other disruptions. I can see them around climate change. There will be some, I feel certain, around the Bayes White Paper, restoring trust in audit and corporate governance. And I'm sure there will also be some around the economic environment that we find ourselves. You know, we're coming to the end of furlough, increased uh, redundancies. Um, if you walk down the high street now, lots and lots of our retail sector shops are shut. Everything is being bought online. That's going to change our retail environment. And it's also going to change how we as internal audit operate and what we need to understand 
in this new world that we are going to find ourselves in. There's also more and more mergers and acquisitions and also there will be insolvency. So there are lots of things happening and I'm really keen to capture those in our disruption hub. So please, please check it out. As we move forward into the new future, please don't forget to look out for Talk to Internal Audit. All of our live streams that we did in 2020 can be found on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't watched any, be sure to subscribe. And a link to the YouTube channel can be found in the comments section of this webinar. Uh, we will continue to share with you our thoughts regarding specific challenges, along with input from our colleagues, members and guests. So please, please stay in touch. And don't forget, you do get CPE points for each of these Talk to Internal Audit sessions. If it's a shorter one, half an hour, you get half a point. If it's a longer one, um, an hour, you will get one point. So there's an opportunity there to really start to build your CPE um, to make sure that you meet the requirements um, by the end of the year when you have to report. Look out for our next session on financial sustainability, which my colleague Derek Jamieson will be leading with a guest. So please join us for that one. And if you have any specific topics you would like us to cover, please share your thoughts in the comments box. And I'm always happy to take questions via email at liz.sandwith at iia.org.uk. So I want to say finally a huge thank you to Maxine for sharing her thoughts with us today. And I'm certain she will have almost written your terms of reference for your supplier audit. Um, if you listen several times to what she had to say, uh, or if you've taken notes, and we will be certain to bring her back again. So huge thank you, Maxine. And I think you won an award. I'm sure I've mentioned that. So congratulations on that and to your team as well. So thank you. Remember, talk to internal audit. The Institute is listening. Thank you and stay safe. Bye. Thank you.